What is the nature of power? And how is it demonstrated in the ancient world? Can we learn from history's examples of war, peace, and plague? Hello, this is Anya Leonard, founder and director of Classical Wisdom. You are listening to Classical Wisdom Speaks, a podcast dedicated to bringing ancient wisdom to modern minds. Today I'm speaking with Dr. Johanna Hanek, Associate Professor of Classics at Brown University about her recent translation of Thucydides. But before we begin, a quick note to say that if you're interested in learning more about Thucydides, make sure to enroll in our Essential Greeks video course, which will begin Sunday, January 17th, 2021. If you want to learn how to approach life like Socrates, have the perspectives of Thucydides, or insights of Aristotle, then this is the course for you. Join me as we explore the life, philosophy, and literature of the Essential Greeks, starting Sunday, January 17th. Make sure to enroll at courses.classicalwisdom.com and use the code SPEAKS at checkout for 50% off. Now, on to the relevancy of Thucydides' speeches and how they can impact modern politics. Uh, You have recently published a book called How to Think About War, an ancient guide to foreign policies, where you translate the speeches uh, from, his, from Thucydides' history of the Peloponnesian War. So I guess the first question is, uh, presumably there are many translations of Thucydides. Uh, why do more translations and what new light do you shed? Well, there are several translations of Thucydides um, out there, but the vast majority of them are of the entire work, the history of the Peloponnesian War. And uh, that work is extremely complicated. It's pretty long. It's a very challenging work. And I think that unless someone is really committed to going through the work in its entirety, a kind of big fat translation of the entire thing can be a little bit off-putting. So what I wanted to do with this book was to provide some of the, the speeches, really the speeches that are famously associated with the Athenians, um, speeches having a, a broad definition, so including even the Melian Dialogue. I wanted to kind of wrap these greatest hits of Thucydides together in one more sort of manageable volume that might be a little bit less intimidating for the reader who is approaching Thucydides for the first time. So I just really wanted to make these particular speeches, which I think are the speeches that are most often cited, referred to in the popular discourse by politicians, by international relations experts. I wanted to make them really handily and easily available and approachable for the first time reader of Thucydides. And so what are some of the challenges of translating Thucydides? Well, Thucydides has his own translation challenges beyond the the sort of normal challenges that you face as a translator of ancient or even um, modern literature, which I also translate, um, in that he's just really, really, really difficult. His Greek is extremely hard. It's very compact. It's dense. It's experimental. Um, and even his readers in antiquity, so Cicero on the one hand, but then also Dionysus of Halicarnassus, who was a native Greek speaker. I mean, these ancient readers comment on how impossible it is to read Thucydides without the aid of commentaries, without the aid of sort of supporting materials. So all of the difficulties that someone like Dionysius of Halicarnassus would have had, who's writing in Augustan Rome as a native Greek speaker, I mean, just those are just multiplied so many more times for someone writing at thousands of years removed both linguistically and culturally. So that's one aspect of Thucydides' Greek that makes it really difficult to render. Another problem, and this is one that is sort of more commonly faced by all translators, is this question of how foreign or sort of domesticated do you make this other language seem to be? So to what extent was it my task, you know, this was something I thought about to preserve the, the complexity and opacity in many cases of Thucydides Greek. And to what extent was it my job to, as faithfully as I could, kind of put forth as clearly as I could my understanding of the meaning of what his speakers were saying. And so that, the, that was really a, an enormous challenge in kind of trying to strike the right balance for this book. Um, So you mentioned the the context uh, is so crucial, of course, when when looking at the the speeches 
from Thucydides' history of the Peloponnesian War and different contexts of, of every dialogue is, is so crucial. Um, but at the very beginning of the Peloponnesian War, Thucydides completely admits that the speeches are not historically accurate, that he's put the words um, as best as he could, but there's many times where you know he's, he's not in the room at all. Um, the Malayan dialogue, for instance, he could not possibly mm -hmm. privy to the exact words. So what is the relevancy of these speeches if we know there is no historical accuracy that we can, we can really verify? So I think there's two aspects of that sort of explain why these speeches are still relevant, both in terms of their original context in classical Athens. I mean, Thucydides himself was a someone who was a general in the Peloponnesian War. He was involved in the Peloponnesian War. He was a, he was a product of his own time in the fifth century, and so his insights are documents of what one might think of as, as a kind of mentality or the cultural context of classical Athens that otherwise is lost to us. So that's why these speeches, even if they don't represent exactly what was said, you know, Thucydides himself says that he cast the speeches that really as really what ought to have been said in the given circumstances. And therefore they they kind of wind up being these cultural documents of something that would have theoretically made sense to a greater or lesser extent in that now lost cultural milieu. So that's that's sort of why I think that these speeches are, are interesting as historical documents, as, as texts in the history of ideas. But then the other aspect of it is that these speeches, particularly Pericles' famed funeral oration, his Epitaphios Logos, or the Melian Dialogue, these speeches have gone on to have such rich and robust afterlives that they've kind of entered into the bloodstream of the mainstream international relations discourse in the United States or, you know, aspects of sort of the discourse about the, the study of history and Thucydides' role as a historian, but also sort of broader questions of how, how history ought to be studied. So on the, on the one hand, the speeches shed light on the particularities of the original Athenian context, but on the other hand, they're really sort of important documents for us today just because they have been important for so long. So the whole sort of set of discourses and, and fields of study has crystallized around them. And so what would you say is the relevancy of these for modern day politics? Well, I don't think that these speeches provide really any kind of blueprint. I mean, the, the title of the book, the book is in the Princeton um, Ancient Wisdom for Modern Readers series, and the title of the book sort of is what it is in, in terms of positioning the book within that series. Initially, I, I kind of was even playing with the idea of, you know, suggesting sort of how to not think about war, I, as we know, you know, what happened to the Athenians who are depicted as giving these speeches, right? The, you know, the empire ends, they lose the Peloponnesian War. But I think that what the speeches do provide, and they're just sort of one set of texts that provide something like this, is they prov provide this kind of set of conceptual frameworks that I think, like any set of conceptual frameworks, can be useful tools for us today. So some of the oppositions that they set up, um, such as the one between the difference between justice and expediency, um, that's, a, that's become a very sort of generative, productive framework for how people think about international relations today. I mean, it's not the only one. But it is, it is kind of another tool in the kit for people thinking about these kinds of issues today. Um, or in, you know, sort of the arguments that are made, for example, in the, the Sicilian debate, when Nikia says, you know, I think that the greatest show of force we could make would be to not go there at all. I mean, this is sort of just an interesting way of thinking about the nature of power and how it's demonstrated. And so what I really think that these speeches do is just kind of give us a, a, a repertory of examples and conceptual categories and vocabulary that serve as kind of lenses for thinking about these sorts of issues today. But again, I don't think that they provide sort of really wonderful advice necessarily in terms of what we ought to do, you know, as a state actor or in terms of our international relations or, or whatever. Uh, yeah, because obviously some of them are, are might is right. and. Uh you know, go to war, otherwise people won't respect you. Uh, so you might have a... Yeah, 
a little bit more violent options than other ones. Right, and I think that, you know, one of the things that I say in, in the introductory material, which I tried to make really ample, is that, you know, I, I wanted to, to translate these particular documents just because they are so famous and have been so influential, but the speeches really only account for a quarter of Thucydides' entire history of the Peloponnesian War, and this is a very select set of speeches. So in just doing the speeches, what you miss then is this really famous juxtaposition of Thucydides' account of Pericles' funeral oration with then the next part of the book, which he immediately moves into, which is his account of the complete anarchy that breaks out in Athens as a result of the plague. So you have this very meaningful kind of contraposition of these two texts that, that gets lost if you just think about the speech itself. What's important for Thucydides, I think, is that is the partially is the contrast that's being generated between this, this sort of idealized image of Athens that Pericles provides as this kind of city on a hill to borrow the, you know, the early New England formulation, you know, with what it became in reality as soon as, soon as some of the, you know, the rules and societal conventions broke down because of the plague. So, you know, in presenting these speeches, I tried to, in the introductory material, I tried to kind of give as much information as I could about the material that the speeches kind of are being presented as a complement to and contrast with within the, the broader work, within the whole history of the Peloponnesian War. That's an excellent point. Um, and I guess uh, I would like to ask too, how much you make analogies with the past? Because Right now, it's, it's you know very popular to bring up the Thucydides trap and this kind of the concept that Thucydides is sort of figured out when we go to war and, and are we going to war now? So, I mean, can we look at these past examples and, and learn from them to, to see what will happen next here now? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I certainly think so. Um, I think that, you know, it's interesting, Thucydides makes this claim towards the beginning of his work that basically this, this concept of um, the anthropion, so people sometimes translate it as human nature or the human condition, that there's a certain steadiness to that. Um, and by making that claim, he sort of suggests, I mean, actually really pretty explicitly, that he wants his work to be read by future generations um, because these sorts of things really just could happen again, because humans are humans and, and these are the way that things unfold. I mean, I think that's, it's an interesting way uh, of thinking about it, and it's not an unuseful one, but I, I do think, you know, my problem with something like the Thucydides trap, which completely subscribes to that ideology and is also, I mean, Thucydides trap is not, you know, classicists and people who are experts in Thucydides have criticized um, Graham Allison's use of that phrase. But I think that, you know, what it ignores is the, the details of history, the sort of that, you know, we are suspended in these cultural institutions. There are, are different circumstances in the case of each and every war. So, you know, it's hard to say that one thing is going to unfold exactly as it will at another time. But I think just as with, you know, when I was saying that Thucydides offers us useful sets of, you know, concepts and framework, intellectual frameworks for thinking about these issues that humans perennially face. Um, I think, you know, just likewise, the, the historical situation that he describes, the outbreak and the evolution of the Peloponnesian War in its early phases, I mean, these provide us with kind of yet another way of thinking about what's going on now. And I think that, you know, really the, the power to be drawn for that is, is to see that as kind of one of several other kind of paradigms from the past, you know, one set of several different concepts that we can, again, add to this sort of toolkit we have for thinking about, for analyzing what's going on right now in terms of our own moment in history and geopolitical situation and circumstances, you know, but not to ever say sort of that Thucydides is, you know, the be all and end all, you know, kind of profit on these, these sorts of matters. That's one place where I think we, we really run into trouble. Thank you for listening to Classical Wisdom Speaks, a podcast dedicated to bringing ancient wisdom to modern minds. 
You can get Johanna's latest book, How to Think About War: An Ancient Guide to Foreign Policy, here at press.princeton.edu/titles/14762.html. Classical Wisdom Society members can listen to the entire podcast with Dr. Johanna at classicalwisdom.com. And for those who are interested in the Essential Greeks program starting Sunday, January 17th, please go to courses.classicalwisdom.com and use the code SPEAKS at checkout.